Great, uh, thank you. Um, so, I just want to talk a little bit about, uh, can you guys hear me okay? Very yeah. well. Okay, great. So, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about stroke, you know, and, and not only relates to TAVR, but surgery, uh, and, and sort of discuss it. I mean, and I think the issue of stroke was highlighted very early on in TAVR, and we've, we, we start talking about it less now. Uh, but if you remember in the Partner One trials, where Vinder is talking about, although it's not a valid that's used, it, 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 the stroke rates were higher with, with TAVR than surgery. Now, they didn't reach significance, it was smaller numbers, but they were nearly double. And it raised a big, big concern. Um, and in, in the editorial that Hartzell Schaff, the in the New England Journal that accompanied the initial publication, he highlighted that as the primary concern. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. But Partner One was an early generation device um, that had, we had less than 100 total uh, experience with the Sapien valve when the trial was initiated. It was initial operators, very few experience, didn't have a nose cone to cross, it was difficult to cross, it was technically a very different procedure with large sheets. And so part of the reason I highlight this is from conversations I've had with patients, when they see other doctors, the stroke rate is still, is still highlighted as one of the concerns with TAVR and one of the limitations. And I think we have to move on from this conversation. That's what I hope to show by this presentation is that the conversation has to change. And you can't keep talking about partner one data. Um, and so in this initial data, yes, stroke was a concern, but this was early experience. And what we've seen over the, the subsequent trials, as we've gone from partner one down to the low risk studies, is stroke rates have decreased. They're not zero, but they have decreased. And especially in the partner three low risk study, stroke rates were less than 1%. And I think, you know, this is where we're getting to, and we have to, it's never going to be zero, but we have to continue to uh, look at the data critically. But the stroke rates, one of the challenges is stroke rates are variable across the trials. And, you know, this is a meta-analysis of 20 non-randomized trials. This is from several years ago, but they found 2.4% major stroke, but you see a lot of variability. And there's not a lot of comparison of THV versus THV. When you look at the U.S. registries, the stroke rates, and this is an old chart, but even now it's in that 2 to 3% range. And these are site-reported. These are not neurology adjudicated. And we know always when neurologists see patients, stroke rates are higher. But this is site-reported data suggesting, again, stroke rates between 2 and 3%. Um, and one of the things is, you know, there's a learning curve to a lot of things. But this initial analysis from TVT back in 2016 showed that there wasn't a learning curve to stroke. Yes, there was an initial drop. But as you gained experience, the stroke rate still stayed in the same level. And that's because stroke is an unpredictable event. And I think that's one of the things to look at. You know, aortic stenosis by definition is a hostile environment. You know, you have these heavily calcified nodules that are, that are sort of friable and we can't really see. And sometimes they're more friable than others. And when you manipulate the valve, you can liberalize this material. This is a very old study, but I think it highlights the point that during positioning and implant of the valve, when you're most manipulating the, the valve, when you're, this is when embolic events occur, whether it's Medtronic, core valve, or Sapien at that time. And the majority of strokes, more than 95% are ischemic and occur interprocedurally. Um, and however, you know, although the majority occur interprocedurally, you see some of these late events. You know, we look at stroke rates as 30-day events, but these early events, you know, in the first 48 hours are probably 70% of the events. Um, and, and and these late events could be the comorbidities, but it could also be, did you liberalize some debris on the aorta that didn't fly off, but later, later embolized? We don't know, but it could be AFib. It could be other factors as well. Um, and these late events may be hypotension, may be AFib, but it may be delayed embolization. We just don't know. And so there's a, some uncertainty. And this was an initial analysis from the partner. One data, again, looking at the timing of strokes, the peak is in the first 24 hours, and there's this big drop off. Um, but you know, the majority of events are in the first 48 to 72 hours. But we also understand that stroke may be underreported. And this is what I was mentioning earlier. When neurologists see patients, stroke rates are in the double digits typically. They do a careful neurologic exam. Does this matter? Is this what's clinically relevant? You know, you, you could argue that. And, and part of the challenge is the brain, you know, is a complex structure. Um, and we, we sort of assess stroke typically by the NIH stroke scale. This is a, uh, a figure I got from one of my neurology colleagues. When you look at the NIH stroke scale, this is the part of the brain that's sort of looked at, right? There's a, you know, you're not assessing the rest of this when you do a stroke scale. 
And we've seen data from MRIs that there are embolic events in at least two thirds of patients. Um, you know, these are obviously we're not having strokes in two thirds of patients, only in two or three percent, but there's embolic events. And, and are these truly silent infarcts or, or are these artifacts is what we don't know. But when you look at the neurology literature, when you look at silent infarcts, quote unquote silent infarcts, they increase the risk of future events, of future stroke, of mortality, of dementia, of cognitive decline, you know, all of those things. So in an 80 year old that, you know, that's barely compensating, if you have embolic events to the frontal lobe, it may change personality, may lead to more dementia. There's all these things that we don't understand fully. Um, and obviously the one of the things that we like to do is, is quote risk. And these are multiple analyses early on that we tried to look at predictors of stroke, you know, and there's really nothing clearly identified. AFib is bad, potentially post dilatation. But one thing we know is severe, severity of calcium does impact stroke risk. Um, and pre-dilatation may impact, post-dilatation may impact, but these are all sort of un unclear. What we know at this point, our event rates are declining. It's an unpredictable event, but the clinical consequences are significant. When you talk to patients, the, the event they care about most is stroke, uh, because it's, that's what they fear. They don't mind dying, but they don't want to live as a vegetable. They don't want to have cognitive decline in their function. That's what they care about. It also does lead to increased mortality. Now that's after TAVR. After surgery, it's different. You know, in surgery, the primary events are ischemic, sometimes from embolic, but sometimes from hyperperfusion. And the embolic the events they have are when they cross clamp the aorta and release the cross clamp. But also it could be from gaseous emboli, you know, uh, when, they, when they do this. And also there could be cerebral hyperperfusion. Um, you know, they're going on cardiopulmonary bypass, you have cerebrovascular disease, and you can get uh, watershed infarcts from hyperperfusion. Uh, or AFib, uh, cerebral hypothermia, all sorts of other issues. So the mechanism of stroke in surgery is different than the mechanism of stroke in TAVR. So when we look at this, how do we compare, right? You want to look at, this is from uh, the different uh, randomized trials. I took away partner one here, but looking at partner two and partner three. Partner two had an average age, these intermediate risk of 81 to 82. These are slightly younger patients. But here you look at all stroke, TAVR versus surgery. What you see is numerically, it's lower with TAVR. Um, and in partner three, it was significantly lower. You see, again, dramatic, all stroke, 0.6% with the Sapien 3 and low risk. 0% disabling stroke. And what disabling stroke is a modified Rankin 2 or more. And if you know the neuro, uh, neurology scale of a modified Rankin score, a modified Rankin of 1 is a very mild deficit. So when we're saying disabling, modified Rankin 2, like most of the carotid neurology studies, they consider disabling a modified ranking of four. So we had a very conservative definition of disabling stroke, even then zero. Evolute, 0.5% disabling versus 1.7, significantly less. So this conversation has changed, and I think it's important to keep that in mind. Stroke rates are lower with TAVR than with surgery. And, and I highlight this the Partner 2 Sapien 3 study. Um, the, you know, this, this was an elderly population, mean age 81, disabling stroke of 1%, all stroke of less than 3%. Um, this is compared to the surgical arm of the partner 2A trial, similar population where the stroke rates were higher. And this propensity matched analysis showed that TAVR had a significantly lower stroke. And so why have the stroke rates gotten less? Is it that we've gotten better? Is it that we're treating lower risk patients? Well, one of the things is, I think the tip deflecting catheter allows an atraumatic passage around the arch, I think the distal tip has this bumper covering the metal frame. So I think that it does allow less uh, atraumatic crossing and less aggressive BAV. But the reality is, is the stroke rate of 1% okay? Y yes, probably, but if anything, why not get it lower? We wanna get it to zero. So the question is the role of embolic protection devices. Two questions to answer that. Is stroke during TAVI still a clinical problem? I think any patients is the biggest thing they worry about, so any stroke is a problem. Second question, these silent events, you know, even the stroke rates are 1%, you're having embolic de debris on MRI and 50%, are they a problem? And do these embolic protection devices work? The ideal device is easy to deploy, you know, not adding additional vascular access. It protects all vessels. The Sentinel device, which is the only device that's approved currently in the US, protects three of the four, the right vertebral, right carotid, left carotid, and the left vertebral is not protected. And obviously, that leaves a portion of the brain that's unprotected and a portion that's partially protected. So those are all important considerations. Um, and the, but the majority of, of embolic events do go to these proximal vessels in these modeling analysis. The ideal device would capture all debris and wouldn't restrict flow. But 
in the end, any embolic event can be catastrophic. These are MRIs from the uh, Sentinel trial, which we led um, in looking at different strokes and deep deficits on MRI. This small deficit can lead to inability to talk, right? So that is a small deficit, and this deficit may not lead to a significant clinical event. So it's all about location. So you've got to try and capture as much of the debris as possible. The, sorry, the, I went back too quickly. So these are the two devices. There's only one approved. This one completed their trial. They still haven't presented the data, so has not yet been approved. We use this in, in all patients that where the anatomy is suitable. If this device is placed from the right radial, this uh, dis, uh, the proximal filter protects goes in the nominate, protects the right vertebral and right carotid. This uh, distal filter goes with, it flexes around and goes into the left carotid. What's shown in the trials is that it reduces uh, that in 99% of patients you capture debris. The trial was not designed as a clinical endpoint trial, um, and it didn't show a significant reduction in clinical stroke, but it was 300 patients. Um, and what you saw, though, was that uh, by MRI, there was some reduction. It didn't reach significance. There's a lot of reasons to talk about it, but we really, it, it's, it's too much detail. In the end, from my perspective, the device was safe. And if we can prevent debris, and 99% of the time we capture debris, I tend to favor use of embolic uh, protection devices. Other ways to prevent stroke, you know, avoiding post-dilatation, minimal catheter manipulation, and pharmacology. And I think that's the one question. Um, can pharmacology make a difference? It's not thrombus, it's tissue in the majority of, of patients. You're capturing debris, which is calcium, or something in, in, in more than half of the patients. This was a trial done in Bivalvin so, versus heparin. No significant difference. So the she, uh, yeah. a minute, one yeah. minute more. I'm almost done here, yep. Current recommendations are, you know, at, we do aspirin lifelong, Plavix for three months. There's some data suggesting Plavix probably does not, is not necessary. Um, and this is one of the studies looking at that. So I generally do aspirin lifelong. If there's any excuse, I don't, I don't continue Plavix in these patients because the bleeding risk probably does increase in these patients. So, you know, and it makes no difference on hemodynamics. The current guidelines, again, aspirin lifelong, Plavix for three months. Um, you know, the use of oral anticoagulation uh, has to be looked at, and you avoid bleeding risk versus thrombosis risk. There are these trials looking at NOACs. The Galileo trial was stopped early due to harm in the river axon group, so uh, generally avoid it. And, and if anything, I use warfarin as a preferred therapy. Other trials are ongoing, but the, you know, cerebral injury is variable. It's hard to assess. What's relevant to a young patient versus an old patient may be very different. There's societal issues, patient issues, family issues in terms of the impact. So we really have to look at it. And the stroke rates have continued to decline. Recent studies in lower risk patients have suggested TAVR has an advantage over SAVR. Embolic protection device in TAVR has shown promise, but its role will continue to evolve. And pharmacology, we, we really don't have a great answer yet. And we're waiting for more data from other trials comparing warfarin versus NOAX in, in this regard. And the issue of leaflet thrombosis is something that has you know, is an emerging issue, and we need to continue to look at it closely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, this is a very important topic. And let me, I think I should ask you this question. Uh, where does it lie in the guidelines at the moment, uh, embolic protection? Uh, I know in the United States, it gets used more often because of the fact that uh, you could be liable as well, rather than it may not be in the guidelines, but once you have a device, you could be, it could be a legal liability. It's not in the guidelines uh, and the, you know, the issue of an accessory device and what kind of trial do you need to show uh, benefit is, is a challenging one. Yeah, so there's an ongoing trial of about, it's gonna be around 2000 patients looking at a clinical endpoint of stroke with the Sentinel device. So that trial will hopefully give us the answers if there's a clinical reduction. Multiple separate analyses uh, from both Germany and from Cedar sinai uh, Rajas analysis have shown when you look at uh, embolic protection and patients before embolic protection that there was a clinical reduction in stroke. These are, uh, you know, matching studies, retrospective studies. So there, there's obviously a lot of confounders, but multiple studies have shown a clinical benefit, but we just don't know yet. So, so it would be fair to say that perhaps it's biggest use at the moment in the United States. Uh, worldwide, it seems Very that fun. people do tower without uh, cerebral yeah. protection. Yeah, and there's a cost, and, you, and when Correct. the stroke rate one and the availability. Yeah. That's right, yeah. and the availability yeah. as well. Thank you, thank you very much, Sushil. Always, a, always a pleasure to listen to you.
there's so much of uh, information that we get out of listening. We have uh, 